OK, great. Um, uh, welcome again, everyone. Um, this is the next in our uh, series of CPD and 43, which is from Cantivic Solstice Glass Masterclass. Uh, really interesting, uh, really looking forward to hear more about what Cantivix do and also some of the really challenging uh, installations of glass that they've done or are doing in the near future. Um, just to quickly uh, run over a couple of our upcoming talks, we've got another one in CPD in 43 uh, on Wednesday 15th of September, which is from uh, Honeywell slash TH White, which would be really interesting, comply, stay alive and fire technology. And then we've got uh, one on the Wednesday the 29th of September 2021. Um, planning and regeneration update from Savills, uh, which will also be really interesting. Um, obviously, I mentioned the year. Uh, we're running quite quickly towards the end of the year. Um, we've got a few more talks uh, scheduled for uh, our calendar, which we'll be releasing soon. Um, and then we'll be moving into our 2022 series of events. Um, so that's it from me. I'm going to hand it straight over to um, Andrew, uh, Andrew, thank you. And uh, if you just uh, take over and I'll be here in the background as usual, please use the comment box if you have any questions, queries and also any uh, questions for the Q&A session at the end. Um, and uh, I'll hand it straight over to Andrew. Perfect, thank you. All right, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. So hello everyone, so quick introduction. So obviously Andrew, uh, I work with Cantifix and um, well, I've been in the industry for some time now, but um, Cantifix has been around since 1986. So me personally, um, I started off working with my, my brother and dad uh, in Oxford on traditional sash windows and then went off to university, um, studied industrial design and engineering. And basically that's led me to come to what is structural glazing. Um, and this is now my second tenure with uh, Cantifix. And um, basically we have a quite quite inspi hopefully inspiring projects but um they're all um I should say we're pushing pushing the boundaries constantly and, and basically that's what I love doing here and there is actually an absolute passion for not just glass but you know delivering lovely projects that we're proud of and, and a legacy here so as we go through the slides 99 percent of them are all of our projects ones which aren't I'll, I'll point out but um I mean to start just want to tell you something is that none of our customers buy glass they buy lifestyle they buy daylight and a connection with the outside world so we'll get going so in fact the majority of our customers aren't actually the slightest bit interested in glass they're creating space with minimal boundaries physical spaces to give them room to breathe and showcase their design and inspire others so here at Cantifix, we've uh, created what is known as solstice glass. Um, this is basically what you signed up to, but as explained, it, it, it's three in one. So we, we have other research and, and we also have technology that all comes together. So I'll, as I go through, I'll explain what, but there are other CPDs which you can, you can sign up to as well. So solstice glass um, is being specifically created to harness and enhance the benefits of, of daylights. Uh, this is through our scientific research and, and also physical testing as the focus on well-being has really switched during the past 18 months with the pandemic and especially now as our work as we're working our way into what is now unfortunately autumn and the daylight hours are, are getting shorter so as human beings uh, we're, we're all instinctively drawn to daylight um, and this is no surprise to many of us as you know when the sun is shining we all want to be sat in our gardens. Uh, many of us travel to foreign countries to get the benefit of more sun. Um, and this is all due to our evolutionary brains, which are conditioned to respond to the light signals in order to set our circadian rhythms. So imagine if we put people into a large petri dish, which is why I've chose this image. It's almost like a little science tube. Um, study their behavior under control conditions. We could learn so much. So the understanding of lights and our relationship to it is surely one of the fundamentals of architecture, which of course I do not need to tell you guys. So this is our work at Maggie's, which works hand in hand utilising glass and its properties. Uh, here they base all their entire philosophy of great palliative care around these access to daylight. Uh, now, let's say Cantifix has been around for 35 years and has built more than 6,000 glass structures. 
um, but we've never really stopped and said why glass um, and I guess we kind of just stumbled into the right market and, and pushed ourselves from there but we went off to understand more so since 2015 County Fix has been conducting field research with Oxford University uh, where we built them an all glass building which is named the photon space this is a picture of it here uh, for participants to stay in and for the first time ever record their biological physiological and psychological reactions to lights and the results were pretty amazing so the graph in the bottom left hand corner shows the black line is our photon space and the gray line is a hotel room so the participants stayed for two 24-hour periods um, and what's amazing is, is how quickly the participants rhythms were reset uh, you can see how fast they dropped off to sleep and how quickly they reactivated and also their sleep was was good and consistent um, you can see especially when looking at the gray line how slowly we drop off to sleep and again how slowly we we reactivate um, and the hotel gray line which is a controlled environment again which was to have the average amount of household natural light which surprising is only down at 17 percent whereas the photon space is 100 percent and this led us on to understand more and, and basically create solstice glass. Um, so as you can see, the clear benefits of, of living in daylight came through loud and clear. So anything that improves our sleep, which improves our health, which in turn improves our well-being. Um, and the participants all reported feeling well or very well rested. The results were significant, so we've moved the photon space to Umeå University in North Sweden, um, where we will continue the research for 10 years, where this is much more extreme measures of light and dark, um, and the first extensive field research into the effects of daylight on human biology, biology anywhere in the world. Um, it was due to start last year, but unfortunately the pandemic has pushed it forward. We're still keen to start this year, uh, but I think it might be pushed back into 2022, but obviously we'll be sharing all of the research and everything that comes out of it with our clients. So what has all this got to do with solstice glass? So if daylight has a huge effect on our activity level, therefore our productivity and our alertness, our creativity, then we should make sure that the glass we installed maximizes this evolutionary effect. So our circadian rhythms are influenced by both the intensity and colour of the light seen by our eyes. I'm sure you've all heard of the dangers of blue light in the evening. And this is the message. This is because the message being sent to our brain is to stay awake and stay active, which is why now we all have blue light filtering apps on our phones. Um, and there's other products such as glasses that can be bought to the market to stop this as well. Uh, Solstice glass is looking at the other side of the process. So we need to make sure the blue light isn't blocked by the manufacturing process, the clarity of the glass, nor any of the coatings that are applied to the surface of the glass. So on the other hand, we need to make sure that the harmful UV rays are blocked. Um, we do have a separate CBD that branches off into the science of wavelengths of light and how the cones and rods in our eyes work to stimulate certain hormones for activity and sleep. So we can, you're more than welcome to join us on that separately, but I won't go into the, the deep science of that now. But our belief is that it simply shouldn't be left to chance. Our health and well-being are far too more too important for that. So our customers often plan their schemes around where they're going to sit, where they're going to enjoy their morning coffee, uh, framing a view, uh, basically their lifestyle. Solstice Glass makes sure that they aren't missing out on anything. The daylight and benefits derived from it are priceless. And of course, we don't pay for the sun. And this is not all. Feeling comfortable, secure and safe is also vital for peace of mind. And while we talk about peace, what about peace and quiet? So we included also to allow for an acoustic interlayer into the glass because we believe that the specification should basically be as best as it can be and then rain back to suit budget. Solstice glass is, is the one stop shop. It's a standalone NBS specification and, and everything you need. And this is the uh, the values of the specification, the glass that we've come together. So the light transmission is 67.8%. So considering around 23% of all light is reflected, this is a very high value. 
Uh, U value of 1.0 uh, exceeds Partel significantly. G value of 34.9% keeps space comfortable and bounces a vast majority of solar radiation to source. And all the panes of glass are also now low iron to remove as much tint as possible and all laminated and heat strengthened, which also mitigates the risk of nickel sulfide inclusions that can be found in fully tempered glass and stops any risk of spontaneous fragmentation. So these next few slides are about, well, we're here to tell basically about the, the specification, U values, G values, and also the possibilities in glass. Um, again, this is part of another CPD of ours, glass as a construction material, but I hope it explains more the solstice glass specification and also how more glass can be used within the schemes you're developing. So as I'm sure you're all aware of toughened heat soaking, heat strength and glass. So in basic terms, floats or anneal glass is not heat treated anyway and doesn't break safely unless laminated. So heat strength in glass is about two times stronger than anneal glass, but again must be laminated due to the break pattern. Toughened is around four times stronger than anneal glass, but can use be safely as a monolithic sheet. Um, this then leads on to a calculation on thickness and what specifications are required. So this is where you look at the statics in terms of wind loadings, um, anything that's going to be applied to the glass, so snow loadings or anything in terms of like fall, prevent, fall, fall prevention. So the thicker the glass, the greener it would appear in, in its standard form. So low iron glass takes out that green tint altogether, which is why we've opted for that for solstice for its ultimate clarity. So here's examples of safety glass and how they break. The top is toughened, which falls to thousands of pieces when broken. Laminates holds broken glass together, but the best insulator to use is, is the SGP laminate, which is Century Glass Plus. Uh, it's rigid, uh, it will hold the glass in place, so absolutely fantastic for balustrades, floors and roof lights, or any oversized glass or any application where you're using structural glazing at all. Um, and again, used in all solstice glass, as it also allows for thinner specification of the glass to be used due to its additional strengths. So U values and G values. So again, I'm sure you, you know this, but just to run through it briefly. So U value is a measure of how much energy is required to heat and cool the space. So low E is insulating and designed to hold radiation heat in the building. As you can see, the current regulations are easily surpassed by our standard glass, let alone solstice. Solar control um, is to limit solar energy entering through glass. Uh, this is by a soft coating applied to a different face of glass for the low E. Um, in the case of solstice, um, it allows 37% of the solar energy through, but blocks at 63%. Um, and in solstice, we actually use a combination of both. So you're getting the best of both worlds. And by being ultra low iron, it takes away a lot of the tints as well. Uh, but there's actually 25,000 different coatings available for all different things. So I'll put together a nice little example here. So this is a coating on, on monolithic toughened and it's uh, it's basically reflective from the outside, but still lets light through. So it's still not you know, great light transmitters, but still lets light through from the inside. So glass technology is evolving and the processing possibilities are constantly increasing. Uh, we do a lot of work with German suppliers um, and also we've got some others. Um, basically, when you go and see their plants, it's incredible. They have, they have 120 meter plus production lines that are all just as, as clean as a surgeon's office. It's, it's incredible. So um, it's always good to speak with us and check feasibility early. Uh, it's an absolute balance between what is possible and what's even possible to get it on site, especially with the benefits of natural light and well-being being the, the challenge of using larger glass panes is constant and, and also needs considering in terms of all these four areas. So as an example of how glass technology is, technology has moved, it, here's the uh, Apple store in New York, which was built in 2006, out of 90 panels for $6.1 million. 2011, it's now done in 15 panels because of the production capabilities meant bigger glass panels can be used, which unbelievably the costs were hardly any different to the original budget in 2006, 0.2 of a million, $200,000. Um, this is one of ours. So this is um, at the Newton Somerset 
and it's a 14.7 meter by 3.2 meter panel which is also an oriel window and this is supported on glass beams as well as stainless steel beams so the original um, designed by Invisible Studios was to have it in five panels, but actually making it in one made engineering sense because basically rather than having soft joints between each panel of glass, you're using the glass as one big rigid beam. And again, this is using the same specification as we do with Solstice with heat strength and laminate inner and outer, um, but obviously just on a, on a grander scale. Another one of ours, this is uh, Walker's Court. So the challenge with this one in terms of glass engineering is that it's got two glass bridges. So one at the base, one at the head, and uh, the bit in the middle where the, where the guy stood. And um, there is no steel support in this structure. So basically this is bonded glass. Um, and the glass bridge is, is inserted into a slot in the double glazed unit, which is about eight and a half meters tall. So there's no joint where the bridge is either. Um, but this is all about access. Um, so being in Soho, this was working in the quieter hours, looking at the road closures and the expense of the road closures and the cranes were almost the cost of the glass. Uh, engineering. So this is our little uh, bridge which you saw earlier. So we're looking at glass beams supporting a glass floor, supporting vertical panels and also a roof line. So this bridge basically spans between an existing building and a new extension uh, is made entirely of, of glass and silicon. But what's even more interesting about this is uh, the differential movement between the buildings. So the bridge accessed this area, which was a new party space for the owners. Um, all the glass here is, is independent to the timber structure, which is allowed to move separately. Uh, the pavilion on Old Great Square, this is by Mark Make Architects. Uh, it looks like a simple design with core 10 steel roof touching the ground in only three places. But the sky frame doors and the glazing over the doors is, is basically where the technology of glass comes into its own. So in order for the sky frame doors to open from the corner without a central post, the top track had to be hung from the glass above. So the top track is structurally bonded with silicon to the glass above. And the glass above is then bolted to steel, which basically acts as a beam from the core 10 structure. And some other views of it there. And then uh, this is a, a new atrium. So basically between two existing buildings in order to create and flood a uh, office with, with light. Um, so it creates more to break out spaces, greater communication and well-being for the staff. And uh, this has an, an Italian silk laminated into the inner sheet. So what you can see there on those images, hopefully it's coming through clear, is it's actually got a uh, silk on the inner laminate. And there's some more photographs, which I hope you can, you can pick that up. But you can also see glass beams supporting the cascading roof light that comes down the building. And then in terms of technology, this is uh, something that we've, we've further developed in house. So this is an all glass staircase with glass balustrade with no silicon. So these are titanium spigots that are laminated into the glass and then attached and bolted to the other panels. We then reapplied this to a floor. So these floors are over a, uh, a Roman ruin. And uh, what, what's so basically these are 8.9 meter floors in a single panel. And rather than having any support under the edge, the support is done by the balustrade above. So it's almost like reversing the glass beams. And it's all laminated into glass and then bolted just literally on two M8 bolts. Um, and these, these glass floors weighed, I think it was about one, maybe one and a half ton. And that's, that's them in practice. So this isn't open to the public yet, but it's, um, it's nearly there. So these are just some shots we took on site. But again, you can see there's tiny little like teardrop titanium fixings laminated into the glass, holding it up. And there's again more on this in terms of our uh, what's possible with glass on our other CPD. And then also this is another innovation by Cantifix, um, and this is the invisible corner. So what we do is basically take two chamfered pieces of glass. We use a UV um, activated glue. We can create double and triple glazed units, so there's no silicon or anything that's sort of a, a structural views for the corner. Um, it's a challenge to install because they've got to come in one piece. So it's all done here. 
and then sent and transported in, in one piece. So we've got, always got to be craned in and there's always consideration of designing these things in. And um, I think I've gone through it pretty quick. So that's that's the end. So if there's any questions. Come through. I come very quiet, so do you want me to stop sharing? How can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Sorry about that. Um, that corner detail just there is uh, really impressive, to be honest. Uh, how is that one achieved there? Uh, there's this little corner detail here. So this, this corner detail here. So, so you can see the two. So between the glass, so you've got vertical glass on the left hand side and the right hand side, which come to a black line. That black line is the edge of the normal unit. Yeah. And seal. And then the rest of from that line to that line is all one panel of glass. So, oh. so that is a double glazed unit. So basically we take the inner and outer sheets um, and we make them separately. So you have left hand panel, right hand panel, yeah. 45 degree mitre, which was then glued together. And then we make the inner sheet glue it together and then bond the two together with the warm edge spacer. And then we pull out obviously the air out of the cavity and put the argon in and seal it like that. So um, like, it's it's a challenge in terms of access because it's got to be transported on a vehicle. So anything that's tight generally means that it's restricted on size. Yeah. Um, but in theory, you could you could go to any size. But the fact is that you've got to get it onto a truck. Um, and again, that's it. It's sort of like a, a, an absolute nice balance between what's feasible, what we can actually get to site, and also longevity. You know, it's 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 going to be. It's replacement strategy put this way is, is pretty invasive, so you'd have to remove finishing and all sorts to get into that. Should I don't know your child put a football through or whatever? Oh, we've got a question in from Mark. Uh, could you go into a little bit more detail on glass beams? Glass beams, yeah. So, in terms of so, if I go back to this slide here, so glass beams is supporting glass structure basically um we'd always use a laminate makeup of glass so these used to always be done with resin and now we're doing it all with century glass so in terms of glass and the way it performs when a glass panel is horizontal it wants to belly under its own self weight when a glass panel is vertical it has a lot of inherent strength in that vertical plane um, so when you're using a glass beam, you're using a short vertical panel of glass, which is usually going to be a triple ply laminate. So you've got the three lots of that strength acting as a beam and therefore there is like zero deflection coming down. Um, and also the lamination strength there as well is, is, is strong. But what's even nicer about them too is you can have these junctions. Um, so you can make because it'd be a triple triple laminate. You can have your two outer laminates larger than your inner laminate and you can basically slot another one in and not have to bolt or anything like that you just just use some clear silicon um, but also it's the same material as glass so in terms of like heat and its uh, movement it's exactly the same so you haven't got any worries and again glass beams are made at the same precision as glass plus or minus two mil so you're not working to steel tolerances and they're going to always be obviously clearer and smaller OK, thanks for that, Mark. Um, uh, we've got another question in from Alison. As well as Italian silk, do you do any other effects or staining within the glazing? Yeah, you can put so it, it's endless. So we've had patinated brass um, leaves put into um, into units. You can have um, we, we worked with a, an artist and we had um, denim put in as well. Um, so so we've, we've done blown aluminium. Um, basically anything you can laminate anything into it so you can have timber in there any pattern that you could cnc cut um yeah it, it, it basically it's endless so um again we've we've had it before where we've um we've taken um stained glass from an artist and we've had that laminated within a unit um because it was um it basically it was a cylinder and at the top of the cylinder was this stained glass detail and rather than it falling through because it has lead leading on it, we, we sandwiched it, laminated it, and then basically then all of our framing is hidden. So it looks like we haven't put any glass to it, but it gives it rigidity and strength. So yeah, it's it's endless. So you can put anything in, into glass now. 
OK, great. Uh, we've got a question from Sergio. Uh, how far are we from a residential dwelling only using load bearing glass as walls, roofs and floors? Uh, well, the photon space is that it, it is that. Um, it's still very <laughs> just say, um, so we, yeah, so we've got we've got we, we do have one. So at the moment we've got another another business which has been set up by my CEO, Charlie. Um, uh, and it's going to be a retreat in Limington down in the um, New Forest. It's quite a way off the, you know, they're looking at, so it's with Tonkin Lu Architects and we're looking at planning, but they are completely glass houses. So glass beams, glass structure, um, and they actually just, yeah, completely glass with glass doors. Um, so we're not far off. I don't know in terms of time scale, the pandemic is just stopped us for a year i'd say or, or more but um yeah we it's designed um it's engineered we've, we've we've got it we've got a concept um i can't share it but um you can, if you come to our offices you can see the model but <laughs> yeah it's nearly 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 there okay great yeah uh well there you go it's an open invite to go have a look at their offices yeah. um, uh Question in from Lee. Four main walkways and staircases, are you restricted by fire regulations? Um, <coughs> I, I, I presume sort of extrapolating that further, uh, just like we can see in the middle with the, the lady in the middle walking up those stairs, probably you need to have some element of tactile sort of surface so that you're not sort of slipping on glass. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, so in terms, in terms of fire, yes, yes we are. Um, so so it's either through suppression or or we have to change the design and, and you, you're going into the restrictive nature of constrained design of, of fire floors, which we, we have EI 60 floors, um, but they, they're generally small and then they, they take any sort of like creativity away from the architects. Um, but in terms of anti-slip, yes. So anything that's uh, residential, you, you, you don't really need to apply anything. Um, we also have part of our design process. We, we pull out all the risks and we have um, like a traffic light system to say you know this is this is an external floor which is immediately outside your door it's going to be wet it's going to be slippy um, but there are certain surface treatments you can do so the obvious one is sandblasting um, which gives you a nice consistent finish um, but it it also it ages and it gets dirty but we've got printed patterns and again we have absolute freedom to print whatever we want and we also use Savasa. Um, so Savasa is a an already accredited um, anti-slip treatment and basically it's just an additional layer that's put on top of the floor uh, which can be either um, so if you look if you google for Savasa and Lunaris um, it has different so you can have like dots like a ping pong ball, bat dots um, you can have um, what do you call it? Like, like hexagonal um, thing. If you see on the on the website, you've got different bits. But basically, those can be low iron, and absolutely crystal clear, apart from where it's raised in the glass. Um, or you can have those also acid etched, so it stops for like privacy reasons as well. But yeah, um, there's another one we're researching at the moment, which is a post um, applied. It's like an acid, um, rather than acid etching. It's a, it doesn't change the clarity of glass. We're not sure how well it works and we're going to do a pendulum test on it but we're hoping that we can get a completely crystal clear anti-slip glass um, which of course we'll market and share but um, in terms of designing in commercial space so from experience uh, we've done the so the floor here is a museum um, so that what you're seeing there is refracted light but it's absolutely clear so they have no anti-slip on it. Um, it's managed because every person that enters the building puts a set of leather moccasins on which have got the anti-slip on their feet so they can't slip on the floor. Um, and equally, there's another bridge which we've done for the same client um, and it's managed. So the concierge makes you wash your uh, feet on the mat before you walk into the building and also won't let you through there on a rainy day. So there's other ways around it in terms of commercial space, um, but it's, it's, it's obviously we have to write this into our our risk assessment and our design risk assessment. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Lewid. Uh, cleaning and maintenance wise, have, having a glass floor, can you get it supplied with a coating to prevent dirt, footprints, etc., or even scratches? Um, no, so yes, you can. You can. So, so the problem is basically 
under a microscope, glass pit has got loads of pits on it, which is why it gets dirt. Um, and that's why you notice, so, so a glass floors or anything that's sort of got a very small pitch of say one degree or, or even three, five degrees, um, glass will cling to the surface, uh, sorry, water will cling to the surface. So um, in order to make it easier to clean, um, you have to fill those pits in. So we have a, we have a, uh, a product called Enduro Shield, which we put in, but the problem is that just makes the glass even slippier. So you wouldn't use that on a floor. Um, but in terms of scratching, uh, no, it's, it's glass, um, it's strong, it will scratch. Um, and what we did with Walker's Court, so I flick back to the bridge. Um, this uh, On this project, oops, sorry, this project. So the bridge where the guy stood up in the air, um, it's got a sacrificial layer on the top. So basically it's a, it's a panel of glass that's laid in on top of the floor, um, which as you walk over and over time, it's going to get scratched, but it's backed on bomb blast film. So basically in, in the future, we're going to go up there, we'll smash that top sheet, roll it up, put a new one down. Um, but that's, that's the only way around. It's a glass, glass scratches. Right, thank you. That's really interesting that you've uh, basically for forethought um, sort of the the lifespan of the that area. That's quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> I've got a few more questions and then we'll bring it to a close. So we've got a question from Michael. Is the solar control a constant? Will it block out the same en same percentage of en solar energy in winter as it does in summer? Yes, it is. Yeah, so when we're designing, um, so if we go back to. So when we're designing in terms of the solar control and the G value, it, it's absolutely constant all the time. So when you're looking at a passive house, for example, we use a 0.5 G value so that it doesn't block the warmth in the winter. So you still get that radiation from the sun. But what you notice is you design so um, a brie soleil shading it outside. So as the sun in the winter months is low, you want the heat to come through. So, so you get that But in the summer when the sun's high, it's blocked by shading externally. So the glass doesn't have to do so much of the job. But yeah, so it's an absolute balance. So talking of solar control, really you're looking at light transmittance and G value. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. If we, we had a G value of zero, then in winter you get no benefit from the sun. OK, uh, we've got a question from Andrew. How do you manage cleaning and maintenance, human load, snow load, water runoff, self cleaning? Uh, ideas, etc. Um, so yes, it's always a trade-off. So in terms of water runoff, um, <coughs> everybody wants flat glass. Um, so we, we we can't make the water runoff without putting a pitch on it. So at the very minimum, we'll always pitch the glass so that the belly in the centre of the glass is higher than the lowest point, um, which means we don't get any pooling. Um, all of our horizontal glass as well, we apply the Endura Shield coating, which just aids with that water runoff, but you're still, you know, a bit like your, your, your car screen and your, your, your car bonnet, you're still going to get water globules on there um, unless we have a significant pitch of probably in excess of 15 degrees. But generally, most of our work is around, I'd say it's three degrees, five degrees pitch. Um, we'll go low as one, one and a half degrees. Floors are at one degrees. So that's water runoff. Um, cleaning. Uh, so it comes under CDM regs. Uh, Again, we we would always say, always calculate um, with with a, with a factor, obviously. So we'll have um, the weight of the glass, the snow load, and then our safety factor. But it would always be considered that we so we again using these high strength interlayers, the SGP. Um, upon failure of the glass, you can still load those. So the theory is that you could get onto your glass roof, for example, or your glass box, clean it, get knocked out, fall over, and then somebody can get up there and, and walk on the glass and still. <coughs> But we, um, generally speaking, we, we have uh, obviously O&M manuals and we talk about having spreader boards, you know, using the right footwear, no sharp objects um, in terms of sort of any abrasive uh, materials or chemicals. And it, it really is just soapy water, which does the job. Um, and then in terms of like breakages on, on vertical panels as well, that's why we use the Century Glass Plus. So you can smash all the panels and the, the, the structure and rigidity is still there. Um, is, what was, is that all the points of the question? Can't... I believe so, yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Yemi. Uh, what percentage uh, heat is retained? 
so what percent, what is the percentage heat retained? We all know glazing loses heat quicker than solid walls. Uh, yeah, so so you're looking at low E. That's that's um, basically keeping the heat in the building. Um, so that's done on the U value. So I can't give you a percentage, but they're basically the U value. So half the U value, half the, the amount of energy consumes a heat and cool space. Um, so again, when you're looking at passive house, um, you're, you're you're bringing that U value down to 0 0.8, I believe it is, for the glass. Um, but yeah, glass is always going to be. Um, uh, the thing we try to do the best when we're looking at our psi values for heat loss on detailing is to get rid of as much framework as possible as well. That's the worst insulators. It's the aluminium or steel framing. So the glass itself, in terms of retaining heat, um, the best thing is, is to then go into triple glazing. Uh, and it's all to do with the slowing down of the heat loss through the panes. So the internal sheet gets warm which then creates a convection current within the cavity, which heats the middle pane and then creates another convection current to heat the outer pane. But obviously you've got the cold coming from the other side. Um, but one thing that you can find with high performing glass is it will condensate on the absolute outside face, which because just because that's still cold, whereas the rest of it's warm, so it's performing well. But funnily enough, people don't like to see the condensation, even though it's doing a really good job. <laughs> um we have a question in from Sergio. Uh, uh, do you have uh, what types of uh, opaque glass technology are you are you are you using? Opaque. So yeah. again, yeah, you, again, you can you can use the interlayers. So we've got, um, I mean, Van Siever interlayers to have different levels of opaqueness. Um, we also have acid etching, sandblasting. Um, you can digitally print the glass as well. So you, you can print onto a, to a laminate or you can print directly onto to a piece of monolithic. Um, we also have switchable glass. So uh, basically it's uh, it's an it's either a film or an interlayer. So it's within, within a laminate or a supposed applied film. So uh, the technology there is is that you have a current going through it. It goes clear. Um, so basically the, all the particles under stand up on end. So the, the best way I can describe it is like tic tacs. So all the tic tacs are stood up on end. So when you're looking on their end, you don't see them. And then as soon as you turn the power off, they go random and flat. They, they, they then create that opaque switchable glass is what we call it. So uh, we use that. That's still got limitations in terms of sizes. Um, so you're, you're more generally looking at, you know, your regular door sizes. So sort of like 11, 1200 wide. I think some sheets could, I think we can go up to 1.8 off the top of my head, but um, it's a technology that's always, it's, it's got to be seen. We have samples here here for it, um, but, but basically it's because it's, let's say these particles stand on end when there's a charge going through them. When you're looking absolutely uh, perpendicular, is that the word we call 90 degrees on the glass. Um, it's clear, but as soon as you look obliquely or at an angle, you start to pick up the particles, so you get the milky, the milky feeling. So we use it, but I say not a lot, a very, very a handful of projects per year, um, especially now for floors, it was a very useful technology because obviously you could switch its, its states. But um, generally we're finding clients are opting to go for some form of uh, fabric lamination into, into the floor itself. Um, of more of a permanent permanent thing, but just enough to sort of break break that view. But okay, great. Uh, we've got a question in from Philip. Um, could you put a glass roof over a swimming pool? Yes, absolutely. We've done loads. Um, so we we did a glass roof, which was actually a swimming pool itself. So it's a, it's a paddling pool over a swimming pool um, in glass. And um, yeah, you what you've got to be careful of is. You, you want to be using laminate glass all the time over pools. So there's absolute, upon failure, there's no, nothing that can fall in, into the water and, and ruin an expensive pool filter. Um, and in terms of the lamination as well, using SGP would be the best choice. Um, PVB in moist conditions can start to, to delaminate if you haven't sealed the edge. So using SGP above a pool um, or even by the side of it is, is an absolute yeah, that's the only way that Cantifix would do that work um, and, and that's how other people should be as well. You can use a PVB 
Um, you just got to make sure it's detailed correctly that there's no moisture that can get into the edge of the unit because it will delaminate um, PVB on its edge. It's, it's, it's not very good. OK, uh, and we got a final question from Alison. How many floors can you go up with only a single glaze with only a glaze structure? Sorry, say again. How many floors can you go up with only a glazed structure? Uh, well, so the maximum size panel that we can make at the moment is 20 metres by 3.2. So that that's I don't know how many floors that would be, but um sorry can you hear that? <laughs> yeah no I did yeah 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 that's, that's a good that's a fair few floors twenty meters wow that's quite a big piece. Yeah twenty meters by three point two so basically it's on the lamination so the laminate um the maximum width you can get to is three point two, um but you can go twenty meters in the other way so that that is your absolute maximum in terms of a single glass panel. Wow, I'm guessing that's used for lobbies etc um yeah so we've got so we've used we've, we've created a solarium Atriums, et uh, yeah we did a solarium on the edge of a pool which was 12 and a half meters vertical panel 12 and a half meter roof and then two shaped ends which are about uh 2.8 deep by three meters high um glass links atriums again we had one went four meters up and then 20 well it wasn't quite 20 it was 18 whoa, can't remember the top of my head um a long way back again by under the 3.2 um and we yeah we have a uh, let's say we, the gymnasium screen which you saw 14.7 um but yeah that's that's the limitations but one thing you got to absolutely bear in mind with that is that transporting a 20 meter long panel of glass there's only one well there's two suppliers in europe that you can get that panel and uh they the van or the vehicle is humongous so for the 14.7 which I want to bring that back up to this one. Uh, we had a partial police escort for the journey. Um, we also had to take out the so lamp posts, um, hedges, fences. Um, so it came from Germany. It took a long time to come over. Uh, the transport of that was like it's probably about sixty or seventy thousand pounds. Because of, because of it, so again, it's it's building that into into the budget. But um, yeah, and that was only 14. So if you put another 5.3 meters on the end of that, it comes even harder. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, yeah, that's well, that's quite interesting to know. Um. <clears throat> so um, I think I'll I'll bring it to a close. Um. Thank you very much, Andrew. If anyone else has, thank you every everyone who has fielded us questions. Um, sorry to those who I haven't uh, answered questions for, uh, asked questions for, sorry. Um, uh, if you do have any further questions, please do get in touch with Andrew directly. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to have a chat with you uh, about any of your projects um, and uh, just generally about sort of ideas that you might have on your uh, proposals that you might be working on. Um, so thank you again, Andrew, um, from uh, obviously from Cantifix, um, speaking about solstice glass and structural glass, etc. Um, as mentioned, uh, we have a couple of talks coming up, uh, which we are quickly working our way towards the our last few of the year. Um, we've got um, just bringing it back up. Um, <laughs> We've got one from Honeywell uh, slash TH White, which is in relation to fire technology on the 15th of September. And then we've got another from Savills, uh, which is planning and regeneration update, which is on the 29th of September. Um, we've got a few others um, for the rest of the year. I think we've got three or four left after that. Um, and then we'll be moving into our 2022 calendar. Um, so hopefully everyone's enjoyed um the 2021 calendar please do send in any suggestions to us directly at site wessex we're more than happy to uh, consider uh, different speakers different events and so on um so that's it from us um thank you again to andrew um and uh, we'll hopefully see you all very soon yeah thank you